Hello everyone. Welcome once again to the series Adventist Issues and Answers. This is episode 4 in this second season of the series Adventist Issues and Answers. This presentation being done on the 14th of July, rather the 14th of August 2021, is continuing the series in which I will address all the talking parrots of D.M. Conright. Parrots who mimic and imitate not just the book, not just the teachings and the thoughts, but even the behavior of D.M. Conright. And as I continue the series of debunking all of their bird on one wing doctrines, it is my intention to continue what I started of highlighting, demonstrating how the teachings of D.M. Conright when he apostatized from the Seventh-day Adventist Church cannot, for the most part, stand up to the intense scrutiny of the Bible. His book, Seventh-day Adventism Renounced, a very popular book among the critics and former Seventh-day Adventists. The critics of Adventists and the former uh, members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Book that you're seeing displayed on screen, very popular among them. It is my intention to continue to highlight the fallacies in the claims and the teachings of this book as it relates to the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so by debunking the fallacies of Conright, then clearly his parrots, parrots like Dale Ratzlaff, a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor, parrots and the mimics like Dr. Clinton Baldwin, a former SDA theology professor from the NCU University, Northern Caribbean University in Jamaica. And of course, it will demonstrate the fallacies in the arguments of the very active and intense anti-SDA critic, former Seventh-day Adventist E.J. Thunder Lauriston, who is now a Presbyterian minister in Jamaica. This episode will be continuing to address the issues related to God's law. In particular, this episode will be looking at the two covenants. I will be comparing and contrasting the two covenants. And so this episode, episode 4 of season 2, will be entitled The 613 Commandment Sinaitic Law or Covenant Versus the Law of Christ. The 613 Commandment Covenant or Law of Sinai Versus the Law of Christ. Welcome one, welcome all, as I continue to deal with issues controversial related to Adventism. This is Adventist Issues and Answers, episode 4 in season 2 in the year 2021. My name is Derek Gillespie. I'm a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I've been a member for 40 years. Now, in addressing this matter of the two covenants and the two laws that are in contention, particularly, particularly the 
613 commandment Sinaitic law or covenant compared to the new covenant law of Christ. I will do nothing but take you to the scriptures to prove the points that I will make in response to all the parrots of D.M. Conright. They do a lot of talking. They are all talk, but when you look clearly and carefully at what the scriptures say, you realize that they don't have a case. So, what I'd like to do, if you listened to episode 3, I advise you to visit my YouTube channel. You can listen to episode 3, which dealt with how Daniel 7 and verse 25 totally destroys the faulty arguments of D.M. Conright and his, and his parrots about what remains in the new covenant as it relates to God's laws. If you listen to that, you will you would have realized the point I'm making, and I'm now going to quote non Seventh Adventist authors, respected Bible scholars, on the issue before I move on to the two covenants. The 613 commandment, Sinai covenant or law versus the law of Christ. Listen to John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, in his honest recognition of what the Bible teaches. He said in his sermon, Sermon 25, um, at, you're seeing at the bottom of the screen, entitled The Works of uh, well, it's stating from the works of John Wesley and his sermon, which was Sermon 25, Volume 1, page 221. He made plain about God's law, moral law in the New Covenant. The moral law, he says, I'm quoting, contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, Jesus did not take away. It was not the design of his coming to revoke any part of this. This is a law which never can be broken. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind and in all ages, as not depending either on time or place or any other circumstances liable to change, but on the nature of God and the nature of man and their unchangeable relation to each other. This is the founder of the Methodist Church making it plain what he understands the scriptures to be teaching. Let me go now to what the Baptist uh, manual makes plain. The church, Baptist church where D.M. Conroy took up residence and became um, almost like an alien in the church, teaching the total opposite of what the church taught and has taught and continues to teach even to this day. Dr. Edward T. Hiscox, author of the Baptist Manual, made plain, there was and is, notice, present tense, and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day. But the Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week, with all its duties, privileges, and sanctions. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I have studied for many years, I ask, where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. Testimony coming from respected scholar in the Baptist Church, teaching the very same thing that, for instance, Charles Spurgeon, who is considered to be the most noted of Baptist preachers in history, he's actually called the Prince of Baptist Preachers, made plain that under the New Covenant, the law of Christ continues to teach that the principles laid out in the Ten Commandments, God's moral principles summarized in the Ten Commandments, are still binding. And if you love God, you will keep the first table which would include, of course, the Sabbath. And if you love your, your fellow men, your neighbor, you'll keep the last six, the second table. 
That is what the Baptist church in which D.M. Conroy took up residence officially taught and continues to teach the very many years after D.M. Conroy has made a lot of noise and come on the scene and has indeed passed and gone. Last quotation before I go to the scriptures. Presbyterian Church. Officially, you you listen to previous presentations I've made in this series and other presentations in response to the parrot of Conrad, uh, Elsie Sunder Lauriston. You'll realize that his own church teaches what he himself is in total denial of. T.C. Blake, famous theologian, wrote the book Theology Condensed on page pages 474 and 475. He made plain. The Sabbath is a part of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This alone forever settles the question as to the perpetuity of the institution. Until therefore it can be shown that the whole moral law has been repealed, the Sabbath will stand. The teaching of Christ confirms the perpetuity of the Sabbath. This now takes me to the issue of the two covenants. What was repealed? What was retained? What is reiterated under the new covenant? Because, you know, what is very, very plain, dear listener, is that the parrots of Conright, they're reading the same Bible that you and I read. They can't escape the reality that the new covenant is not one that gives you license to sin. It is not one that is lawless. It is one that does, it is not one that is lacking in commandments of God and principles and commands and laws that we are bound by that we should obey. They have no choice but to have to admit that reality. And so what we realize is that both covenants, the old covenant called the uh, the old covenant, which is called, of course, the, while I'm talking, I'm trying to zero in on my first scripture, which I'd like to highlight to delve into the issues. The old covenant of 613 commandments, the Jews estimated it to be what is called a Sinaitic covenant, was a covenant that was based on laws. 613 of them, but simply represented in summary by the Ten Commandments. The New Covenant is also based on law. So all of this talk about covenant of grace, well, the grace that appeared to all men, grace that bringeth salvation, has appeared to all men. There's no dispensation of grace compared to dispensation of law. The Bible teaches clearly. Paul himself in Titus 2, verses 11 and 12, may explain that the grace that bringeth salvation, any form of salvation that can be experienced by any human being, the grace that does that has appeared to all men. It appeared to Abraham. It appeared to Noah. It appeared to Adam and all his descendants after Adam sinned. But what does that grace that bring it salvation appearing to all men teach that you have to be an obedient follower of the God that you worship. Teaching that you should deny ungodliness. That's Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through to 12. I don't need to go there because that issue was already dealt with in episode 3. You can go back and watch that episode entitled how Daniel, in fact episode 2 as well, dealing with Romans chapter 3 and verse 31, and how Daniel and Rome and episode uh, 3, dealing with Daniel 7 and verse 24, shows how the new covenant laws include holy time and law and commandments dealing with God's holy time. Um, and obviously, it clearly involved the Sabbath. As you can see, Presbyterian author in the quote earlier testified to. The Baptist author in the court earlier testified to, the Methodist testified to, John Wesley. So, this talk about covenant of grace as if it is just limited to the new covenant, nonsense. 
all the parrots of Khan, right? They, they, they could talk until they are blue in the face, which is what parrots do. While they imitate and mimic DM Khan, right? They cannot escape the basic teaching of scripture that grace has always been there as God's covenant with all men. Because Jesus was, was, was actually given to the human race as a surety from even before creation. Revelation chapter, I think it's Revelation chapter, uh, I'm not sure of the chapter right now, but in Revelation it makes plain that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. There was so much a surety that he would be our savior. That is why grace has always been there. Um, so, let me not get off track. Let me go now to the issue of the two covenants and the two laws. The 613 Sinai covenant or 613 commandment law or covenant compared to the law of Christ under the new covenant. Now, why am I saying that the two covenants are based on law and both are based on grace? Because the Bible teaches it. Grace has always been the means of salvation for everybody and anybody. It has always been there. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 through to 12. You can't escape it. You can't explain it away. You could give your opinion a little more about um, the new covenant, the covenant of grace. We are under the dispensation of grace. You could talk until you're blue in the face. It doesn't change your Bible truth. That grace has always been the means of salvation. But while that grace is there, what is constant and remain true is that all of God's people that he saves, they have always been obedient to him and will continue to be obedient to his commandments, obedient to his law, whatever that law might be at whatever time he gives it, obedient to his commandments. That is what grace teaches. So now we come to what the scriptures actually make plain about the two types of covenants and the two types of laws. And we want to compare them. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, that is on screen. You can see plainly, dear listener, that as I go through, you'll realize that this talk about, you know, old covenant being law-based and new covenant being just grace-based. It will be made plain to be absolute nonsense coming from the parrots of D.M. Conrad who want to create a certain narrative and yet they can't escape it and that is why they can't escape the truth rather that the new covenant is also law-based and that is why they, they have to backpedal and recognize that there is a law to Christ that Christians are under compared to the old covenant or what is called the law of Moses, which was a combination of over 600 commandments. So, here we go. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. But now he, I'm reading, Jesus Christ, of course, obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then there should be no place have been sought for the second. Where did the fault lie? Not in the covenant. Not in God who made that covenant. But notice verse 8. Finding fault with them. That is the Jews. The people who were supposed to be loyal to that covenant. Finding fault with them. He saith, Behold the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I made the point earlier in the third episode go back and watch dealing with daniel 7 verse 25 destroying canrites canright and his parrots made the point that the new covenant was a covenant made with the same jews same israel and so therefore the new covenant is not a covenant with gentiles it's not a covenant with the christian church it's a covenant with the people that god called and called them israel and just that the same principle where you have to go through Israel to be part of or to benefit from this covenant. The same is true under the new. In fact, Paul made plain in Romans 9 and chapter 9 and chapter 11 that 
a Gentile to become one of Abraham's seed. Galatians 3.29 If he be Christ, then are he Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You have to be grafted into the household of faith through Israel. You have to become a spiritual Israelite. Or you, you were like a wild olive tree, he explains. And therefore, you are you're no better or different from the branches that are the original Israel. You have to go through the same Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. You have to be of the same household of faith and you have to partake of the same covenant made with Israel. And how do you do that? Through Christ. You become like a wild olive tree grafted into the household of faith, which is the house of Israel. There it is. New covenant made with the house of Israel or the house of Judah. God continues, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not. Notice the fault continues to be highlighted was with the people being unfaithful, not the covenant itself being so-called insufficient and not perfect and and yet it is the same God who talks about all of his law in the Old Testament. The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19 verse 7, I think it was. That is God talking about the Old Covenant, 613 commandments. All of his laws given through Moses. Whether it be the civil laws, moral laws, um, ceremonial laws. All together, God described his system as perfect. So where did the fault lie? There it is, with the people. And so because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Verse 10, this is the covenant, therefore I will make with the same people. Renewing of the covenant, but on better promises and with different terms. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Notice, still based upon God's laws, and we're going to discover what the scriptures teach about what the new covenant laws are about. I, make my, I, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Therefore, the new covenant is not a covenant that is totally absent or has absent in it laws or God's laws. No, it's not a covenant just, just based on grace. No, it is just like the olden principle. Grace appeared to all men teaching you to be an obedient subject. Titus 2, 11 to 12. Now, this, of course, means that if that old covenant is going to be abolished and a new one take over, then what you have is clearly two types of covenants in contention. And that is why I'm calling this presentation the 613 commandment covenant or law versus the law of christ or the new covenant what is the new covenant the law of christ there it is on screen we saw it earlier the new covenant is also based on god's laws not just based on god's grace the parrots of conrad like to mislead people to think verse 13 of hebrews 8 in that god saith a new covenant Obviously, he makes, he made the first old. Now that which they gave and walks it old is ready to vanish away. Now, so clearly we can see that there are two covenants in contention. Clearly we can see that there's a change in the covenant. And since the covenant was law-based, then clearly the covenant made up of laws would also change in terms of laws. That's the teaching of scripture. In fact, let's go to the chapter before, Hebrews chapter 7, and let's go down to verse 12. And let us see what the Bible teaches as opposed to what the parrots of Canright would want you to think. So in verse 12 of Hebrews 7, it says, The priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now notice, he did not say an abolishment of the priesthood. A system of priesthood continues 
though it may be in a different format or a different way, but it did not say an abolishment of the priesthood. No, change. In other words, you alter the type of priesthood. Therefore, there is necessary a change also for or in the law. Notice it did not say a total abolishment of law. It says a change. In other words, there's going to be some alteration, just as there's an alteration in the priesthood, because we know that Jesus continues the priesthood, but in a different type of priesthood, the, Mel the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is superior. And we know that as Christians, all believers are considered to be kings and priests of God and of Christ, as the book of Revelation may explain. And we're asked to be intercessors on behalf of kings and people of the world. So in other words, is there a total abolishment of priesthood? No. Just a change in the type of priesthood. We are now everybody who once you're a believer, you have full access to the throne, just as the high priest would have had. Why? Because we have that access through Jesus Christ, a man now that is in the direct presence of God always. And so there is not an abolishment of priesthood. There is simply a change in the type of priesthood. Therefore, there is not an abolishment of all laws, as the parrots of Conright would want you to think. No, there is some alteration. Now, obviously, if there were 613 commandments and there is a change in this law, we want to know what is the change. That's what this study is about. When we think of the old covenant consisting of 613 laws compared to the new covenant based on God's laws, which has a law to Christ, and I think I should take you there now to that scripture which, which compares old covenant law as opposed to new covenant law of Christ. So let's go to, I think it's what? 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul may explain that under the new covenant, there is no absence or total absence of law or total absence of commandments. Because the, the new covenant God promised it to be based on him putting his laws in our mind. So it is also a law-based covenant. And so it is not a covenant that is based on the old 613 commandments of the Jews. But now let's discover as we go along what this new covenant involves in terms of laws and commandments. So 1 Corinthians uh, 9, let's go to I think verse 19. And here it is, um, Paul is speaking, he considers himself free in Christ under the new covenant. Free from what? Free from the bondage of all of the 613 commandments in terms of as a package. Is he free from all, every single commandment that was in that, in that um, old covenant? No, he's not. Because as we, we will discover and have discovered in the past, several of those commandments were reiterated under the new covenant. We know that because to love your neighbor as yourself is a commandment straight from the old covenant. To love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, two principles Jesus said were in the law. Which law? The old covenant law. And that now governs Christians under the law of Christ. Now let us discover what the Bible says about these two types of law. Verse 19, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that's Paul speaking, that I may gain the more. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I may gain the Jews. In other words, Paul is saying after he became a Christian, remember he was always a Jew, you know, and he was always a Pharisee. Well, he was a Pharisee up until his conversion to Christianity. So he was literally a Jew. What is he talking about when he says he became as a Jew? What, what Paul is saying is that under the new covenant, he has a different system to operate by. But in order to win the Jews, he will operate like them in some instances so that he can draw close to them, win their favor, and then win them to Christ. And so he says, unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. In other words, 
the way the old covenant Jews who were stuck in the 613 commandments mode of the old covenant were still trying to operate. He became as them so that he could win them. He said unto the Jews, unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I may gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law. In other words, when he says under the law, he's talking here about they are under the old, operating as if they are still under the old covenant jurisdiction of the 613 commandments. In other words, that is what the Jews were contending that anybody who was to become a Christian or who was to become a follower of Jesus and to become a fellow Israelite, they were required to become circumcised and keep all 613 commandments. That was the insistence of Jews with the old mindset. And Paul is saying, at times I became, I operated as they did so that I could win them. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. The law here, 613 commandments as given through Moses to the ancient Jews. Now to them, verse 21, that are without law, in other words, he's talking about the Gentiles who never had, not just the Gentiles, but new covenant Christians who are operating under a new covenant, who never had these 613 commandments applying to them in every single aspect. To them that are without law, as without law. But notice now he clarifies that new covenant is not lawless. It doesn't give you license to live anyhow. And therefore you, you, you don't have any law to obey. Or commandments to obey. Notice he says to them that are without law. As without law. In other words they were not given that 613 commandment law. As the Jews at Mount Sinai. But he says be not without law. But under the law to Christ. He's recognizing what all of these um, parrots of Conrite can't help but recognize. That there is no way you could talk about the new covenant being a covenant based only on grace. And it's only, it's only, it's only founded upon grace. And it's, it's, it only has involved in it grace. Nonsense. The scriptures teach that new covenant is God putting his laws. So therefore it involves laws just like the old covenant. What's the difference? The difference is going to be with the number of laws and commandments. And whether or not you should be keeping all of the 613 commandments of the old covenant. That's a big difference, you know. So we continue. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I may gain them that are without law. In other words, Paul is saying that Gentiles and new covenant Christians are not without law. They have a law to Christ that they ought to observe. It's not lawless. If it was, it would be contradicting the scriptures, contradicting the promise of God himself that his new covenant would be based upon laws. He'll put his laws in our mind and in our hearts. And so, Paul is here saying that the Jews, continuing with the old mindset, thinking that you have to observe all 613 commandments of the law in order to be a real, true Israelite. Paul is saying that at times, he operated as if he was a Jew, with that mindset in order to gain them. So in other words, that is why Paul, despite circumcision was abolished, in order to draw close to the Jews and not create too much um, animosity and uh, discontent and conflict, he engaged in ceremonial activities like Ceremonial washings and cleansing, uh, circumcising Timothy. Why? Because he knew that this was the only way to open the door to being able to reach those tough-headed Jews who think 
that you still have to keep all 613 commandments to be considered a real Israelite. And so Paul is making plain that there is a law to Christ. There is, There are commandments to keep, but they certainly are not all of the 613 of the past. That's what scripture teaches. And so anybody who comes to you with new covenant being all about grace, grace, and no law, and no commandments, false gospel, false teachers, heresies, heretics, let us continue to have the scripture speak. We go to uh, Romans chapter uh, 3, and we go to verse 31, and we see the same principle being taught. Paul, after in that chapter talking about only by grace through faith you are saved or justified, he then makes plain that this new covenant system does not make void all of God's law. It obviously make void and abrogate those aspects which are no longer necessary to observe. They are no, they are no longer part of the law of Christ. To love your neighbor as yourself. Straight from the old covenant system. To um, love God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. Straight from the old covenant system. So there were laws that were plucked out, reiterated as principles that must govern the Christian. And that is why Paul made plain in Romans chapter 3 and verse 31. Do we then make void the law? In other words, he's saying, do we get rid of everything? Certainly not. God forbid. Why? Because the grace that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And that's what the principles of law and commandments are all about. So the 613 commandments as a package served a purpose, a function. When Christ came, the covenant came into being several of these laws would therefore have died a natural death because they serve their natural their function and would therefore naturally die out and fade away. Commandments to circumcise, sir, come on, because now we are circumcised in heart. Commandments to, to um, offer lamb and turtle love. Now we have Jesus Christ who is the new and the real lamb. Commandments to have a Levitical priesthood. Now we have the new priesthood. Note it's not an abolishment of all priesthood. Not an abolishment of all laws, but simply a relaxation of some, while a reiteration of others. Not a the abolishment of all priesthood, but a change, an alteration in the type of priesthood. And that is why Paul made plain in verse 31 of Romans 3. Do we then make void the law? In other words, do we get rid of all of it, abrogate everything? Certainly not. God forbid, he says. We establish the law. What law is he talking about? Not the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. He's talking about laws which command actions. Because the, the issue was by no deed of the law. In other words, those commandments which require action and response. You will not be justified. But when you're justified by faith, does that get rid of all of the laws? Certainly not. That's what Romans 3 and verse 31 is, is making absolutely plain. You go back to episode uh, 2 of this Adventist Issues and Answer series in season 2. Uh, dealing with Romans chapter 3 and verse 31. You will see how it totally debunked the parrots of Canright. As it relates to the new covenant and, and God having still having laws for us to observe. Now let's, let, let us see this even further. When we go to Romans chapter 6 and we go to verse 14, we realize the same thing is taught. Talking to Christians, new covenant Christians who are saved and justified. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin, oh yes, it has a wide variety of meanings. But one of the meanings which you can't escape is biblical. First John 
3 and verse 4. Sin is a transgression, transgression of the law. You can't continue to be a lawbreaker, at least those laws which remain in terms of the law of Christ, and say that you are operating under grace. Another proof that the new covenant is law-based because it has laws locked up in the law of Christ. For sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, transgression and disobedience and rebellion against God's law or God's principles or commandments which are still operating, many of which are drawn from the old covenant itself and reiterated under the new covenant. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. Notice, you're not under the old covenant of 613 laws. You're not under his jurisdiction to follow all those laws that all, every uh, misguided Jew was requiring Christians to observe. But Paul is still making the point. Do you then live without any form of law or commandment? No. He says, sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under law, but under grace. What then? In other words, he's saying, sin shall not have dominion over you. Rebellion or transgression or disobedience should not be a part of your life because you're not under the law. In other words, the Old Testament system of 613 laws. But you're now under grace. He's making the plain point of Romans 3 and verse, Romans 3 and verse 31. Shall we sin because we're not under that 613 commandment law system of the Jews? But under grace, God forbid. Knowing not that to whom he yields servants to obey. Notice the issue is about obedience. And therefore it is a matter of still recognizing that when you become a follower of Jesus, you still have obedience that you must demonstrate. Obedience to what? Obedience to the law of Christ, obedience to commandments that are under the new covenant, obedience to laws that still remain. Know ye not that to whom ye yield servants, know, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience. Notice, obedience, obedience, obedience. That word is hated so much by so many in Christendom can't escape it obedience unto righteousness and of course paul continues be god be thanked that you were the servants of sin servants of disobedience transgression of god's law but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you being then made free from sin sin in other words, sin in its various forms, whether it be sin in your nature, sin in your mind, but also sin in your actions, transgression of God's law. You being made from free from that um, sin in its various forms, he became what? Servants of righteousness. To be a servant of righteousness is to be one who is obedient. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Titus 2, verse 11 to 12. What does that grace teach you? That you should live righteously, soberly, godly. That's about obedience. You can't escape it. The new covenant, the law to Christ, is one that is based upon laws and it is also based upon grace. And it involves obedience to specific commands and specific laws and instructions and directives. Now, let's go to James chapter, in fact, let's go to Romans 8. To Paul extend the very same point as we go down to verse 6. He's making plain that you cannot be a new covenant Christian and behaving like the world of sinners. What does the world of sinners do? Verse 6. To be carnally minded is death. The wages of sin. Transgression of God's law. A mind of rebellion. A mind that is not converted to want to respond to what grace teaches. That you must live soberly, righteously and godly. As an obedient subject of God's kingdom. 
to be carnally minded is death. Spiritually minded is life and peace. Notice what the carnal mind is all about. The carnal mind is enmity. It is the enemy of God for it is not what? Subject to the law of God. What do you think therefore is the opposite of that? To be spiritual minded it means that you are in oneness and harmony with God. You are subject to the law of God. So the carnal mind is totally opposed. Anybody you hear this totally throwing out all of God's laws and, and commandments and believe that is all about just grace, grace, grace. Agents of Satan. Because the carnal mind is one that is not subject to. You notice what is constant between both commandments. That's why, you know, God says I am God, I change not. Does mean that he doesn't change his commandments or his law. Because he may explain in, in, in um, Hebrews 7 and verse 12 that he does change his laws. But notice, laws are always there. It's a part of God's government. And so the big difference is no longer are we obeying 613. But we certainly have commandments and laws to obey. And where did they come from? The vast majority of them were drawn from the old covenant set of laws. Every listening the hearing of my voice knows that. That is why the, 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 the teachings of Jesus, it was always his habit to say, What do thou what do, what what do, dost thou read? How readest thou? And when he was confronted with Satan's temptations, it is written, every teaching of Jesus on the, on the mount, they were based on the principles of God's laws that he drew on, reiterated many of the old covenant laws that God said he was put in our mind, defended those that would remain such as the Sabbath. That is why Jesus' life was one spent throughout his life defending the validity of the Sabbath and how it should be kept and what was lawful under it and making plain after he left that his disciples should pray that they don't have to confront the awful um, situation of persecution and where they have to flee on the Sabbath because the Sabbath would remain. We have proved that in episode 3. Daniel 7 verse 24 making it plain that one aspect of God's laws that remains is a principle of his holy time. That many false Christians would try to tamper with and to get rid of. And so what we find here, listener, is that Paul throughout his teaching is making it plain. The new covenant, the old covenant was based on grace. The old covenant was based on laws. The new covenant is based on grace. The new covenant is based on laws. The only difference is the old covenant was 613. The new covenant is obviously less than that. The old covenant was recorded on tables of stone and written in a book. God now wants through the Holy Spirit to make them become a natural or the ones that remain become a natural part of our lives. Where we, 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 we serve him because we love him and we operate by the power of Jesus living within who himself was a law keeper. He says, if you want to abide in my love, do the same thing that I did. I kept my father's commandments and abode in his love. That's a teaching of scripture right throughout. When we go to, for instance, to uh, James chapter 1, a clear indication of how the new covenant is built upon laws and principles drawn from the old covenant. James chapter 1, and we go to verse 22, and here is what James says. Be doers of the word. Which word? The old covenant word. Because at that time, the new covenant, the, the new testament scriptures were not yet fully written. 
So he's talking about the scriptures already written and fully accepted and canonized. Be he doers of the word. What was that word? Old Testament scriptures. Not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For any be hearer of the word. Which word? Primarily Old Testament scriptures. And not a doer. He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forgeteth what manner of work. Of man, what manner of man he was. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Which law is that? Written in the word. Already written in the word. Drawn on by Jesus and his apostles. But obviously he's not talking about the old covenant of 613 laws. That is what was now abolished as a package. But from that package... It's drawn principles that still apply. Notice, whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continent therein, he is being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. And of course, that is why Paul made plain, not Paul, James made plain, that if you keep the royal law to love your neighbor as yourself, what was Paul, what was James drawing on? The word written in the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, principles drawn from the Old Testament covenant, the old covenant that would now be reiterated in the new. If you keep the royal law, Paul, um, James said, to love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, let's go there. And when we go to... Uh, here it is. Verse 8, if ye, who is who's James talking to? New covenant Christians, whether they be Jew or Gentile, it matters not. If ye keep, fulfill the royal law according to scripture. Notice, he's going back to scripture. Old Testament principles, drawing on them. The same thing that Jesus did. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Where did this commandment come from? It did not originate with Jesus on the mount of si on, um, on the mount in Matthew chapter five. No, it originated in the old covenant, and Jesus drew on it and said, "This principle must be part of the law of Christ." And here James is doing the same. If he fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He do well, and that is why later on he's making the point. That in order to observe this principle, you have to observe all laws or commandments which flesh this out. You can't be partial in observing this principle in terms of the moral laws that still remain part of Christ. What is that law which still remain? The Presbyterian Church acknowledges it. The Baptist Church acknowledges it. John Wesley of the Methodist Church acknowledged it. And as you have seen in, in earlier presentations under this series, I've shown how the vast majority of Christians in the body of Christ, Christendom, recognizes the principles are locked up and summarized there in the Ten Commandments. And so that is why when James reached uh, verse 10, he's speaking about not being partial in the way you operate in observing this commandment, this royal law to love your neighbors yourself. So what did he, he do? He drew on the Ten Commandments. And you can draw on something and apply it to the law of Christ and, and be saying that that is totally abolished. How can it be? Whosoever they shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that saith, do not commit adultery, he also saith, do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Which law is he talking about? Law which remain applicable as part of the law to Christ. Love your neighbor as yourself, fleshed out by these commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, honor your parents, etc., etc. And we know that these commandments are still applicable as part of the law of Christ. The very Ten Commandments, law itself, in terms of the principles, they are drawn on and applied under the New Covenant as the law to Christ. How we know? Let's go to Paul in Ephesians. And let us see how Paul applied 
the Old Testament commandments of the ten. Notice in verse in Ephesians chapter six, verse one: Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Notice, honor, verse two: Thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What was that promise? You will live long on the earth. To the Jews, it meant Canaan. Now to the new covenant Christian, with this law commandment still applying, not abrogated, not gotten rid of, according to the powers of Conrite. But it is still applicable, but applied now to this in general. Wherever you live, God is promising you that it will be well with you, verse 3, and you will live long on the earth. Notice, no, not in Canaan anymore, but you will live long on the earth. So that is why we know that the Ten Commandments continue to bind the Christian under the law to Christ. Because here is an application of not just what the commandment says, but even the promise locked up in it. Where was that promise recorded? Under the Old Covenant Scriptures. What that therefore means is that all of these persons are telling you like D.M. Conright and Elsie from the Lauriston and Dale Ratzlaff and Dr. Um, Clinton Baldwin that all of the law, all 613 commandments were abolished, totally gotten rid of, set aside, relaxed, no longer necessary to be observed. Not true. Obviously, the number of commandments now are less than the 613 commandments. Because when you speak of the law to the Jew, it meant 613 commandments. When you talk now of the law of Christ, you're talking less commandments, less than 613. Applied now, not just to Israel and Canaan as a nation, but to Israel and the spiritual Jew, wherever you are on the earth. The law of Christ, therefore, law of Christ, Therefore, is a drawing on the commandments and principles locked up in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament scriptures, and reiterated once they are moral in principle. And that means that they will obviously be less in number because the law to the Jew was a mixture of ceremonial laws, civil laws governing the nation of Israel, as a theocracy and of course moral laws and those moral laws summarizing the ten not only the ten summarizing the ten would naturally come over because they are moral it is always moral to recognize God as a creator and only him and nobody else and no one else should be worshipped it's a moral principle to recognize that, that God should not be replaced with idols. It is a moral principle to recognize that you should respect that God and his name. It is a moral principle to recognize that God established from creation, before sin, before shadows, everything, a celebration of himself as creator. And it should always be remembered as such. And that is why the Sabbath is a moral command. And the six commandments about loving your neighbor, they always remain they will always remain. And because there are other moral principles outside of the Ten Commandments, that is why several of the other commandments will remain, such as Paul demonstrating when he drew on the principles of not um, sleeping with your, your, your own gender, homosexuality. What was he drawing on? Principles locked up in commandments in Leviticus, not to commit the abomination of homosexuality. Who in their right mind today as a Christian could say that the law is about not sleeping with your mother or your sister or incest as it were. Those are abolished and set aside. Who in their right minds could ever come with that kind of nonsense? So yes, many of the laws have been set aside because they fulfill their natural purpose. The 613 commandment law of Sinai as a package the agreement that holds you to observing all of them is abolished. But the new covenant draws on many principles in that old covenant and makes them a part of the law of Christ. 
That is why when you go to James 1, you see James quoting the royal law to love your neighbor as yourself. Ten commandments. When you go to James 2, you see James is fleshing out that royal law. Ten commandments he's quoting. And when you go to Daniel 7 verse 25, a prophecy of what would happen in the future to God's laws that would remain under the old covenant, under the new covenant rather. You see, it can only be understood to be Christians trying to tamper with God's holy time which remain. The Sabbath. Always there from creation week ended. And so, when we go to Galatians chapter 4, I'm bringing this to a close dear listener. When we go to Galatians chapter 4, we see the comparison of the two laws given in a parable. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. And in Galatians chapter 4, here's what we see Paul explaining the two laws to be like. One, 613 commandments, the other, much less, and now applied not just to a special nation in a special designated area, but to people all over the planet who accept Jesus. And so are now general Israel all over the planet, not just Israel located in a specific location in Canaan. Notice how Paul explains the two covenants based on laws. Here is Paul's argument in verse 24. Paul says, speaking of the, the two children of Abraham, he says, these things are an allegory, meaning a parable, an illustration. For, the, for these are the two covenants. The one from Sinai, which genders the bondage. In other words, 613 commandments. Jews who insisted they have to be circumcised and keep all of these 613 commandments. Bondage. Because many of those laws have served their natural purpose and are no longer necessary. But because the new covenant is also based on laws, laws and many of them drawn from this old covenant, the new covenant therefore would be laws that would be less in number and not bond you to all 613 of the old covenant. For this is Hagar. I continue, let me read it again. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai. And remember, the covenant of Mount Sinai is a 613 commandment covenant. Summarized just in the 10. But when you think of the law and that covenant, it can't be just about 10 commandments. It's about everything adding up to 613. And it genders to bondage, which is a agar. For this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which is now, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. It is the mother of all. That is where Jesus is now located. Zion in heaven, Jerusalem in heaven, the sanctuary in heaven, new priest Melchizedek. And so it is very, very plain that the new covenant is related to Jerusalem above and Jesus being above. Now, Jesus being above, what does he say about his laws that would be would remain obviously less than 613 not a whole package now as was given to the jews but laws less in number what did G the jesus know of a better covenant who is now located in jerusalem above say about the laws which pertain to the new covenant let's hear jesus i don't have to i care not what the parrots of Canright say such as dm Canright. I'm sorry, well, Conright himself and his parrots like Elsie Thunder, Lauriston and Dr. Clinton Baldwin and Dale Ratzlaff and others. Dirk, Dirk Anderson. Well, Dirk Anderson, I assume we'll be dealing with his issues as I will deal with the matter of Ellen White and the controversy surrounding her in later um, episodes of the series. So I assume get to DM Conright, who is the most noted um, anti Ellen White critic on the net these days. But I'm coming to him. But I'm now dealing with these issues of the covenants and the law. And so let's go to Jesus and hear what Jesus says. Speaking from the Jerusalem above, which is now free, 
what is the new covenant laws? What are the new covenant laws spoken from Jesus of the covenant from Jerusalem above? Let's go to Jesus, book of Revelation, last book given to Christians on the new covenant. And what does that um, last book say from Jesus himself? Let's go to verse 1. Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. So, in other words, the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Speaking as our high priest from Jerusalem above, in the sanctuary, the true sanctuary, the real one. The real priest that is now in operation under the, the new covenant. Here is what Jesus says. Let's go to chapter 11 revelation chapter 11 verse 1 we know that james already made plain that there are laws which remain out of the 613 there are many that were drawn on and still up reap still remains only the new covenant and are now reiterated so when we talk about 10 commandments the old covenant was not just the Ten Commandments. The Old Covenant was 613 commandments, but represented by the Ten. Now, are the Ten abolished? Since we know that commandments have been drawn from the Old and reiterated in the New, are the Ten, notice, Ten computer 613, are those Ten all set aside, totally abolished? Let's hear Jesus speaking from Jerusalem above for the New Covenant. John saw a vision from Jesus. He was given me a rod like a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Once you're going to worship, measure people who are worshiping, it means that you're measuring and assessing and analyzing their character. And their character is being measured and analyzed and compared based on a standard. What's a standard? Let's hear Jesus. Verse 18. The nations were angry and thy wrath is come. The time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. Same saints who Revelation 14 verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What commandments are they keeping? Let Jesus tell you. And them that, uh, I continue. And thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great. And thou shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Verse 19, the temple of God was opened in heaven. This now is Mount Zion, Jerusalem above. It's not Sinai below. The temple of God was opened and it was seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. Why is the ark there? Because despite the package of 613 commandments are now abolished, you are not held to ob obeying all 613 as a package. You are now held to obey commandments drawn in lesser number, of course, than the 613 from that old package and reiterated. Here it is. And in basic summary, God is telling us that it is still in the law of Christ important to have no other God before Jehovah. It is still important on the law of Christ to not make graven images or have idols and bow down to them in place of Jehovah. It is still as part of the law of Christ, to respect God's name. It is still important to remember the Sabbath so that it points you to Jehovah as the creator of all. Angels, Jews, Gentiles, the whole universe that can never come out of style. And Jesus is making plain, it is still important to honor your parents. Still important to not steal. Still important to not kill. Still important to, 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 to um, not commit adultery. And to covet and to lie on your neighbor. Why? These are all moral principles. They will remain and they will remain to judge you. So I care not what the parrots of can write. They, they want to reject what the Bible says in, 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 in favor of their own opinion in terms of how they interpret scriptures and cherry pick what they feel like to support their own doctrines. It matters me not. I'm going to present what the scriptures say and leave it 
for the few faithful followers of God. Why? God, Jesus himself already made plain that the vast majority of Christians will be lost. Why? Because they are disobedient to God's laws. Engage in iniquity. Continuous rebellious um, existence against laws of God that they don't like. That is why Jesus made plain. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Same Jesus who just told you that the law of Christ that remains. Of the 613 main ones that remain. Not all 613 remain. That is why the law of Christ is different from the the law of Moses or the law given to the Jews or God's law in the Old Testament. They were 613. The new covenant law, law of Christ, has less in number. And it's not notice applying to the Jews as a nation, spirit, a literal nation, but is applying to Israel all over the earth. Jesus says to everybody, not everyone who say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You want to know what is God's will? The Bible defines it. I delight to do thy will, David said on behalf of Jesus. In the prophecy of um, Psalm 40 and verse 8, I delight to do thy will, yea, thy law is within my heart. That is why the new covenant has God putting his laws that remain in our hearts, in our minds. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter. Not everyone who claims Christian and, and, and quote Bible and do all kind of preaching to downtrod the truth of the scripture to support the popular view of the populace. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, have we not prophesied? Oh, done a lot of preaching in your name. Have we not in thy name done many miracles? Cast out devils. Have we not in thy name done many wonderful works? Whatever that work may be. Charity work and whatever work. Then I will profess unto them, Jesus says. Notice, you know, he's talking about many, which mean the vast majority. He will say unto them, I will never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. Iniquity comes from the Greek word, which means practicing lawlessness. Anything that remains part of God's will for you to observe like Daniel 7 verse 25 confirms under the new covenant and a part of the law of Christ. It has holy time that is to be observed. And the only holy time that is in contention that, it, that remains to be observed by every true follower of Christ is a Sabbath. You don't want to observe it. James makes plain the principle. Keep the whole law. In other words, the law of Christ that remains. You offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Especially when knowledge is brought to you repeatedly and you rebelliously refuse to accept it and still follow the popular sentiments of the world. You want to know when something doesn't ring true? Look at the numbers of people who follow it. Generally speaking, when it comes to the things of God, you should always be worried when the vast majority support you. Something is wrong. Generally speaking, God's principles that are in contention, the vast majority of Christians and the world will not accept it. Only a few. And so, my dear listener, we don't have to be confused anymore about the two covenants. The two covenants are plain. They are both based on grace. Because grace is a principle that has always been there. That God is the only way that God saves people. But under the old covenant as well and the new. God has laws and commandments. The old covenant. Law of Moses. Law of God. What was it? 613 commandments. Not 10. Nobody fool you. The 10 only represent in summary. The principles that were fleshed out in the 613. Love for God, love for man. But under the new covenant, Jesus and all the apostles drew on the principles of the old. Now the covenant of laws in the new covenant, the law of Christ, is less in number than 613. But it includes the principles 
that are drawn from the Ten Commandments as well as others outside the Ten. That's the difference. And we see plainly from Jesus himself that the new covenant laws that God had put in our heart is still summarized and locked up in the Ten Commandment principles in the Ark of his covenant. Revelation 11 verses 18 and 19. You can't escape it. And so I close their listener with a reiteration. The real issue, you know, all the parts of Conrad, this is what they want to get rid of. Well, let's hear from the Presbyterians. The Sabbath, said T.C. Blake, Theology Condensed, page 474, page 475. There it is on screen. Read along with me. The Sabbath is part of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This alone forever settles the question as to the perpetuity of the institution. Until therefore it can be shown that the whole moral law has been repealed. The whole package of 613 commandments, the agreement that binds you to all of it is repealed. But many of those commandments out of the 613 have been brought back and reiterated on the new covenant. That's the difference. And what is it that is drawn on and reiterated? The moral commandments. Until therefore we can be shown that the whole moral law has been repealed, the Sabbath will stand. The teaching of Christ confirms the perpetuity of the Sabbath. I don't have to get back into that because I already dealt with that issue. Dr. Edward T. Hiscox of the Baptist Church where Conrad took up residence, made plain, there was and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day. But the Sabbath was not Sunday. Don't need to say any more. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, made plain the moral law containing Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets. Jesus did not take away it was not a design of his coming to revoke any part of this. And we see plainly throughout his life <coughs> where he quoted from it to say these are the ones that you should keep if you want to enter life. Where he defended the Sabbath from it. I, didn't, I don't see Jesus anywhere defending the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles or defending the, the Passover or defending the the, the, the whatever other annual sabbaths there were but he spent his life defending keeping the sabbath and how it should be kept a clear indication that it is those principles that will remain after he left earth and still apply to his new covenant followers what can I say Truth is the truth, whether you like it or not, whether the whole world rejects it or not. It is going to come down to the issue of what aspect of the law to Christ are you ignoring, disobeying, rejecting, and following the popular sentiments of the world in ignoring it. It is going to come down to that, and that is why it's going to be a test issue in the last days. Is the only one that God says, remember, the whole world, including the parts of Conrad, are trying to tell you to forget. God is saying, remember me because I am your creator from the beginning. I create the whole world and this is what points to me as your creator and celebrates me as your creator. And even when you have rest in me as a creator, Jesus is saying, the Sabbath will still remain. And that is why Paul was keeping it. That is why um, the Gentile... Christian Luke was keeping it in the book of Acts. That is why we see it is the only commanded holy time that was being observed as the assembly time for the Christian church right throughout the book of Acts. No command anywhere to observe Sunday. Nowhere. Man-made tradition trying to overshadow God's holy time that Daniel 7 verse 25 made plain that under the new covenant an ungodly system of Christians will try to tamper with it. I close with a Presbyterian minister, T.C. Blake. The Sabbath is a part of the Decalogue. This alone forever settles the question 
as to the perpetuity of the institution. How we know that that is true? Because the principles summarized in the Ten Commandments can never be out of style. And that is why I think I shouldn't close with the words of man. Let me close with the words of God. And that is why we see Jesus himself made plain in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. When the time comes to judge all, which laws that would remain out of the 613 as a package that no longer binds everybody, which out of that would remain? There it is. Temple of God, New Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Jerusalem above. The word of God comes and rings true and clear. There was seen in his temple above the ark of his testament. What was in that ark? Everybody knows. The Ten Commandments which summarize the principles of morality. Love for God, love for man. Based on those are fleshed out all the teachings of Paul, all the teachings of Jesus, all the teachings of James, all the teachings of Peter, everybody in the New Covenant. Because 613 no longer applies as a package. Drawn from that package are less. And in that package of the remaining commandments, in the law of Christ, Ten Commandments. I have done my job. I now leave the rest to God. Only a few will accept the truth of God. The vast majority will always reject it for popular sentiments. But God has always left a witness. And here it is. Jesus, the greatest witness to the truth. Thank you for listening, dear listener. God bless.